the extracurriculars that I've been a part of here that have led me to being president, none have been more inspiring or as impactful as my work with the sustainability movement at PCC. There's a lot of talk about green and going green these days, but and the talk across Pasadena City College is no exception. Since the establishment of the Environmental Club Seeds of Change in 2007, eco-conscious students have been relentlessly striving for a more sustainable PCC. Uh, and they've been advocating for more efficient energy protocol, less impactful food options in the cafeteria, and more sustainable infrastructure throughout the campus. Under the leadership of Dr. Ling O'Connor, an environmental professor here, and also uh, the winner of the Green Technology Award for Sustainability in California Community Colleges, uh, many steps towards these goals have been made. In the last couple of years alone, the first sustainability committee was established as part of the Associated Students. Both a permaculture garden and an organic garden were installed on campus, and students organized to save the Arroyo Seco Hahamanga Watershed Park from being overdeveloped with soccer fields. Many successes have been attained, but there's still much work to be done, which brings us here tonight. Tonight, you'll get to be a part of this progressive history all of our students have been striving towards. The main focus of the Associated Student Sustainability Committee is to inspire and increase awareness of sustainability in every sense of its definition, economic, social, and environmental wellness. We hope that tonight's conversation will do exactly that. To begin our event, I'm very excited to introduce people that truly embody sustainability, um, in, embody what the Sustainability Committee is here to do. Hannah Israel was appointed as the very first Associated Students Vice President of Sustainability. She's already made great strides in that role by pushing a sustainable agenda for the whole of PCC. From working with the Speech 9 class to bring the Think Before You Buy event, to sponsoring this event right here tonight to kick off PCC's second annual Sustainable Living Week with workshops, events, and clothing swaps, Hannah has succeeded in not only bringing awareness to the student body, but also being a major driving force on this campus for continued sustainable change at PCC. So tonight, I feel very honored to introduce two people that never cease to inspire me, my friends and sometimes my muses, PCC's first Vice President of Sustainability, Hannah Israel, and the always inspiring Dr. Ling O'Connor. Thank you, Jamie, for that intro, and all of you for coming out tonight. After spending 738 days in the branches of a 1,000-year-old redwood known as Luna, Julia Butterfly Hill began to open the eyes of the world to the fate of our ancient forests and the destruction that awaited them if we didn't stand up to the logging corporations. Her two-year monumental struggle saved both Luna and the forest surrounding Luna within three acres, which stands to this day as a protected forest. And this is just one of Julia's amazing accomplishments. As an award-winning activist and writer, she works tirelessly to bring the attention of the world to issues of conservation, along with real change in her speaking tours and publications, showing her own commitment to sustainability on every level of her life. Her best-selling book, The Legacy of Luna, and all of Julia's works are published on sustainable printing. And soon we'll be able to see an ecologically sustainable feature film on Julia's experiences in her life and with Luna. With the same message of sustainability and self-empowerment being spread from colleges and universities like this one all the way to the US Congress and United Nations, we can all admire Julia Butterfly Hill's tenacity and clarity in bringing hope and respect for all life on this planet. Daryl Hannah may be known on the big screen for acting in over 50 feature films since the age of 11, but it's her passion and commitment to global sustainability, both in her personal life and in her public works, that we celebrate her today. Using her high profile to champion causes we can all stand behind, speaking engagements have taken her from conferences and universities to national television appearances speaking on green issues to Good Morning America, Bill O'Reilly, and particularly engaging to those who'd be more skeptical of global sustainability, such as Sean Hannity. As a documentary and narrative filmmaker, Daryl has produced a host of material on green issues, from short and inspiring vlogs hosted on her website, dhlovelife.com, to the numerous green spots in short films. And while still finding time to edit a documentary currently in the works, Daryl is able to find time to write articles on green issues for magazines such as Marie Claire and Veg News. Having, been, having given featured 
keynote speeches at events such as the UN Global Business Conference and the National Biodiesel Board Conference and the UN General Assembly itself, Daryl also founded the Sustainable Biodiesel Alliance, certifying biofuels produced in sustainable ways proving that it is possible to simultaneously live a full and sustainable life from organic gardens to solar-powered homes to spreading knowledge and passion for converting our fuels and our minds to sustainable alternatives, Daryl Hannah brings the concepts of green living to everyone she meets. Her dedication and ability is respected worldwide and continues to be tonight. I am so honored to be able to have these two inspiring, wonderful people with us to talk at PCC today. It is with great pleasure that I introduce Julia Butterfly Hill and Daryl Hanna. Hello. Hi there. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for taking time out of your busy life to join us today and having a conversation with us. So, um, Julia, so every time I mention your name, everybody says, oh, yeah, the most famous tree sitter. So, uh, is there something you would like to share with us, just beyond just fill out the blank, just the tree sitter? Yes, I, I will forever be known as the girl who lived in a tree. It's kind of like the woman who lived in a shoe. It has that same, <laughs> the girl who lived in a tree. I will share, but I, I would like to begin by thanking you all very much. Um, I, I really, really get that our time is a sacred resource. It is a gift. Your time is very precious and very valuable. And the fact that you chose to be here tonight, I do not take it lightly. I'm, I'm actually very deeply touched that out of all the things you could do in your life tonight, that you're here. And even if you're just here for extra credit, <laughs> which I think some of you probably are, I, I want you to know that I care that you're in this room too. And that as we share in conversation tonight, part of the reason why I love this format is because I'm really committed that we dissolve the myth of like expert on stage and audience in the chairs, right? I mean, it'd be great if we had a really cool living room setting that we could all hang out in and work that way. But this, you know, this room setup is a little better for all of us to be able to have this conversation. But I want you to know that, that for me, anything I share, I'm not trying to claim to be an expert or uh, an, that I have all the answers, but rather that I'm just sharing authentically from my own life's experiences in hopes that the conversation can lead us all to ask ourselves, myself included, what can I do with my life to make the world a better place? That that's really why I'm here, that my hope and my goal is that when we leave here tonight, all of us, no matter what our beliefs are, that all of us leave here more excited to make a difference in the world in whatever way we feel called to do, whether it's for the trees or animals or elders or children, whatever it is, that we leave here a little bit more jazzed and excited about, about making a difference in a way that is meaningful to us. So I just want to say that at the beginning so that you know that I really care about you and your time, and that I'm committed to doing everything I can tonight to make sure that you leave here feeling like your time was well spent and was well invested. So thank you so much for being here. And yeah, go ahead, give yourself a round of applause. That's right. <laughs> yeah. You know how much traffic I went through to get here? Damn. <laughs> you know how many times along the way I was like, I signed up for this? What? <laughs> I had like a car full of people. I thought there was going to be a carpool lane. Wrong. <gasps> Holy cow. So I know that I wasn't the only one stuck in traffic who's in this room tonight. So thank you. And I want to thank you as well for the stand you are in this campus, in this community, for knowing how many obstacles you've come up against and yet you are still such a vibrant commitment to what you're passionate about and that you're making real impact in the lives of people who are going to take the experience here on this campus and become leaders in the world. I'm just really present to the incredible contribution you are and you reached out to bring us here and now you're also moderating the conversation so thank you so much. <laughs> Well, thank you, thank you, and actually, really, I feel it's an honor to be to be alive at this time, to be called to to be of service to to the community. So, mm -hmm. really, I really feel deeply honored that that there are so many people working together to try to make a difference in the world. Mm -hmm. So, I'm just really excited to be part of it, and thank you. Mm 
Yay, it's teamwork. Yeah. <laughs> so now I'll answer the question. You know, that's me. I don't ever follow the rules, ever. <laughs> Ask me a question, I'm going to answer something else first. So the, yeah, I, I am most known for living in a tree for two years. And yeah, I kind of what brought me to that place and how that's led me forward is a very interesting story. And the story has some really great lessons in it. I did not grow up with an environmental ethics awareness. I was taught to respect nature and appreciate nature. I was taught don't throw trash on the ground. If you see trash on the ground, pick it up. The basic kind of tenets of just basic decency and respect. I was taught that. But I was not aware of the reality of what we've done as a species on this planet and how much harm we've caused to this earth and as a result to ourselves. <clears throat> I was raised traveling around the country and I was raised very poor, and I was made fun of a lot for being poor. I'm five foot ten, and I've been this tall since I was 12, and I wore hand-me-downs, and there's not a lot of hand-me-downs that fit five foot ten, 12-year-olds. So my pants were always too short, nothing ever quite fit. They used to call me High Water Hill, because the pants were too high. Now wearing high pants is in style. People even roll their pants up with their boots. Like, now it's cool, but back then it made me... <laughs> It made me ostracized. I was the ugly, gawky, stupid kid who had ugly clothes. And so because of that experience growing up, I decided what this culture kind of perpetuates, which is our purpose is to make money. And that's kind of the common theme. It's all over the place. It's even in how we base our value as a country, how much money are we generating as a country. It's, it's kind of our collective story that we've either on purpose or not on purpose, agreed to the story that our value is about making money. So I decided that's what I had to do. And I came to university and I majored in business in college. And opened up, co-opened up a restaurant and club with my father when I was 18 years old. And then sold that business, became incredibly self-destructive for a little while. And then got my life back in order, became a consultant for the restaurant and bar industry, was doing very, very successfully. And then in August of 1996, a friend of mine called me. She'd been drinking, and she asked me what time I got off work, and I said, I get off work in about 20 minutes. She said, will you come pick me up? And I said, sure. So I got in a cab, went to her, because I, I haven't even owned a car since I was 18. So this particular night, she asked me to take a cab to go to her. So I did, I got in a cab, went and got her. We got in her car. We made it out of the parking lot to our very first stop, and we were hit by a drunk driver. And she had a two-door hatchback, and he had a Ford Bronco. And it shoved the back of the car into the back of the seats. The glass from the back of the car ricocheted off the front windshield, cut my eyes and my face and my chest, and the steering wheel of the car went into my skull. And I lost a huge portion of my short-term memory and my motor skills. And the gift in that is that that steering wheel literally and figuratively steered me in a new direction in my life. <laughs> and I've since realized that like I am so darn stubborn, the universe has to literally shove a steering wheel in my skull to get me to change directions. <laughs> so that's part of where I share my story with people. It's like if you can learn from my mistakes, really, if you run full force towards that brick wall, it's going to hurt when your head hits it. <laughs> like you might not want to do that. So for me, steering wheel in the skull made me reevaluate what is real value versus what is perceived value. And oftentimes when people have near-death experiences or go through any kind of severe traumatic injury like I did, that's often the case. We start reassessing why we're here and what's really valuable. Two weeks after I was released from my last doctor, after the wreck, almost a year later, I went on a road trip with friends. I entered the Redwoods completely blown away. Just so like my jaw was on the ground. I just could not believe how beautiful and just like the quiet in those forests are unlike the quiet I've ever experienced anywhere. The smells, the, the air is so pure in those forests that it tastes sweet on the tongue, you know? It's like in certain cities at certain times of the day, especially you can taste the air and it's not sweet. <laughs> you know, the pollution is like acidic in the mouth. It's so strong you can actually taste it in your mouth. So I'm in these forests and it's sweet and it's beautiful, it's profound. And I was so touched on such a deep level. And then I entered my first clear cut and saw this area that looked like a bomb had been dropped off where they clear cut it into the forest. I mean, they clear cut the forest into the ground and then they light it on fire with diesel fuel and napalm. 
and there's like nothing left. It is literally a war zone where there was this once beautiful ancient forest. There is now a war zone. And as deeply as I've been touched by the beauty of the redwoods, I was as deeply devastated by the destruction. And I thought, I really, I can't believe this is happening. And what I found out since then is a lot of people couldn't believe this happening. Most people think redwoods are protected. All, all the time people say, oh, redwoods aren't protected? No, they're still not. So when I, when I saw that, I, I felt like I really needed to do something. But I didn't know what. And oftentimes, what happened to me next is what happens to a lot of us. I had the not enough conversation. We had, our, our society is built on not enough. Not enough time, not smart enough, not pretty enough, not rich enough, not re enough resources. Like we have a society built on a conversation of not enough. And I did that to myself. I said, well, I'm not an activist. I don't have any experience. What can I do for these forests? And then in my meditations, the answer that came to me was, Julia, if you have the ability to speak out or take action against an injustice in the world and you choose to be silent and walk away, your inactions are as much a part of the injustice as the actions of others. And it was so loud and so clear that as much as I wanted to ignore that answer, <laughs> I couldn't because I knew it was true that my inactions change the world just as surely as my actions do. So I made a commitment to help the forest. I didn't know what I was going to do or how I was going to do it. Heard about tree sitting. Somebody said, tree sitting is where you sit in trees to protect them. That's about the extent of my tree sitting 101 class. <laughs> but you know what? I grew up with two brothers and no sisters. And we were poor and we traveled around the country. I climbed in trees all the time. And I heard I could climb a tree to help the redwoods. I was like, sign me up. I know how to do that. And that's what launched me into this action that has now gone around the world. When I first went up, I thought I was going to, I actually went up three times. I'm most famous for the third time. The third time I went up, I thought I was going to be there three weeks to a month, and it turned into two years and eight days. And the reason why I kind of share that story to begin with is because there were some really valuable lessons for me in that that I feel are valuable for all of us. Number one is really recognizing that piece that we all make a difference all the time. And not choosing not to do something actually has an impact in the world just as surely as choosing to do something. So that was a profound lesson for me. Another great lesson for me was that we shouldn't let the fact that we don't know how to do something stop us from trying it anyway. Sometimes you just have to put one foot in front of the other and trust that you're going to learn what you need to learn to do what you need to do. And then the final piece, and then I'll shut up, <laughs> is that the best part about that beginning experience for me was realizing that who we are is exactly who we're meant to be. That we so often are conditioned to try and be someone else. If you look at all the cover of the magazines, they're all about selling us about being something other than who we are, buying something else. You know, it's all about not being who you are. And I, I ended up going into this action because I grew up with two brothers and no sisters climbing trees because I'm really good at playing by myself. I need to sit in a tree by myself for a while? Cool. I like being by myself. And then I've also been stubborn and getting into trouble since I was two. I just finally learned how to direct it into good causes, right? So I love to share that beginning story to say, no, really, even the parts of ourselves that we might have been taught or we might have told ourselves are negative aspects of who we are, we don't need to even change them. We just need to shift the focus. And if we do that, we can set ourselves up to have lives that we wouldn't otherwise be able to live if we're living a life that says, I'm not enough and who I am is not enough. That if we shift it and say, no, I'm exactly who I'm meant to be and how can I show up? anything becomes possible. Well, I think I'm going to have to sit with that for an hour. <laughs> wow, that's awesome. Julia, I have a question. Was that, is, is your tree sit the longest tree sit in, in, in record? Yes. Yeah. The, I didn't set out to set a record, and I, that's not really how I live my life, you know, but um, the national record was 42 days, and the international record was 90 days. So, yeah, it kind of set a record. <laughs> but it was really, I mean, it was, people see it as one action, but it was 738 days. 24 hours in a day, 60 minutes in an hour, 60 seconds in a minute. There were literally some days where I was like, if I can make it through this second, I might make it through another one. That was as far as I could reach because it was so overwhelming. And um, 
luckily I didn't know that I was going to be in a tree for 738 days because I never would have done it. <laughs> it would have scared me too much. And I really like the way you talk, it framed like perceived value. And our perceived value is really so much shaped by commercials. I mean, the minute we are awake or even not awake, there's all these, you know, sort of ways of shaping perceived values for us all the time. And, and also that not enough, always not enough. I mean, like the Little Mermaid song, you know, I've got this and that, but you know, I don't care. I want more, I can't sing. But <laughs> sort of that's sort of like, you know, the American, you know, way, you know, that says everything about our society is so amazing. But this is what we feed to our kids, you know, this is how you should feel, you know, it's amazing. And also I love the way you talk about how, so in a way the not enough is sort of a bunch of lies has been fed to us, you know, trying to get us to see things a certain way and act a certain way. So in a way, sort of their lies have been fed to us that we sort of ourselves, you know, sort of continue and nurtures, you know, in a way. So, um, and, and absolutely, and what we absolutely, like you said, we have to connect our actions to what's going on. Your inaction is actually, you know, sort of like, you know, you can't just stand there and watch and say, I'm not doing it, we're all doing it. And I love it, thank you so much. And I love the way you're able to tell it as a personal story, thank you. So Daryl, so how did you find green on the big screen? Green on the big screen. Oh my gosh. I, I mean, I remember that. <laughs> um, <clears throat> wow. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure that's the place that I found it, but, <laughs> but they, the two, two stories kind of do fold together. Um, and also sort of starting in my childhood, I grew up in the 42nd story of a building in downtown Chicago um, and uh, was pretty well protected and shielded from the natural world and in fact you know that was my uh, experience as uh, a young uh, child was that we needed to learn how to protect ourselves from the natural world insulate ourselves and you know and and defend against it and and so I, I always just felt really weird like I was an alien and like nothing made sense to me and I was you know, treated like that as a kid too. I was an outsider always, and I just felt like, where am I, and who are these people, and what are these tall things that we live in? And it just everything looked just was bizarre. You know, it was all like, and so uh, I, as a kid, I had insomnia, and I would uh, instead of uh, uh, you know sitting in my my bed and just letting my brain ramble on and worry and wonder about things, I would sneak into the TV room and go watch movies uh, late at night on TV, and that's when I sort of fell in love with, with film, and, and because it took me to another reality, and, and it was just like a you know, visceral dream. It was, it was fantastic. And, um, and then when I was about seven, my, my dad did a really great thing for me, which I... I Things saved my life really is that he sent me off to a camp in the wilderness in the Rockies. Um, it was a camp that he went to when he was a kid, and for two months every summer, from the time I was seven till I was 17, I lived in covered wagons and um, we had no electricity and we had a horse pack and backpack and we <clears throat> had to care for our horses and start our fire and pitch a tents and all that stuff. And, and that's where I realized wow, okay this works, this makes sense, I understand it, you know, I, I actually could do it and, it and I could communicate with the horses and understand them and I could light a fire with one match or even sometimes no matches and I could, you know, that, that the natural world was made a lot of sense to me and, and, and then it became sort of my, my church. Um, I had was also raised Catholic and was sent to Sunday school where I um, got in trouble like Julia all the time. I was in trouble. I got kicked out of Sunday school and as far as I recall, I was the only kid in the history of my Sunday school ever to not be able to pass First Communion. Um, <clears throat> it was because they said that they told my mother, who was very upset because my mom was, you know, she was thinking of being a nun when she was a kid, so it was like, really traumatizing to her that her daughter would be kicked out um, and um, but they said there look she spends too much time staring at the fish tank um, and she spends a lot of time staring out the window too and she colored the pictures in in her Bible 
and, um, and she asks too many questions. And, you know, some of those questions were like, you know, why couldn't we chip the gold off the ceiling and give it to people who are hungry in the world and take the, you know, chalices and cash them in and all this stuff. They just didn't like it, you know. And, but I, I think that was actually when I, when I realized that that was the thing that they didn't like, I was, it kind of, it pissed me off, you know. Like, I, I was hurt because I was really taking the tenets that they were teaching me in Sunday school very deeply to heart, you know. So I believed, you know, not, not so much in the, you know, story about baby Jesus and all that, but in, in the tenets, you know, I really, I really took those stories to heart. And so I, I was just that pissed me off. So I decided to remake my own church and my church became when, when you were the natu- seven? Yeah. And my <laughs> Wow. And my church became the natural world. And that was sort of what became my church. And then I got fascinated with uh, native cultures and, and other cultures, indigenous cultures that lived in harmony with their environment because that seemed to be the way the the or the holiest way or the most sacred way to express that you know, well, actually, the, just the sanest way to live, really, I guess. <laughs> and, and so um, in fifth grade, I wrote a report on my sort of end of year, you know, report was uh, written on, on that, and I called it The Simple Life, and I got an F um, because they said my teacher was furious, and mainly furious at the title because the paper, she said, was written very well, but obviously, I, she said, I didn't understand my subject at all because this was a very difficult life to have to live in harmony with your environment. You know, it was very difficult. And so anyway, I was just, uh, you know, kind of continued my, my life as an outsider um, for, you know, most of it, even, even in terms of my, the cinema stuff, you know, I mean, I did work, I started working when I was 11, um, but I, I didn't ever really kind of feel comfortable with, um, I loved disappearing into another reality and into another character, but I never felt comfortable with the side of the movie business that's so prevalent now, which is the sort of self-exploitation and the like, you know, prancing around on red carpets and dresses and all that stuff and going to parties and being like a celebrity and all that. I just, that part was not of interest to me and also not only not of interest, but maybe extremely uncomfortable. And like, I literally thought I would die and faint if I had to do any stuff like that. And, and so it wasn't really, well received that I wouldn't do that stuff, um, uh, obviously. Um, but I, I eventually learned how to get out of my own way. Um, I mean, when I when I started educating myself more and learning more about you know the uh, you know sort of destruction of the natural world and other species and stuff, um, I, I I I figured the most potent thing that I could try to do the most effective thing I could do was to try to live by my beliefs. And that's why, you know, you hear about my lifestyle, you know, choices and things. Um, and I just thought that was really the, the best thing I could do. And I still believe it's sort of the best thing that any one of us could do is to really take, uh, take a little personal x-ray and, you know, see what we can do. And it's a constantly evolving process. I mean, I still need so much to simplify and so many ways I need to continue to evolve in that way. Um, but I, uh, but I, I, I just thought that that was the main, main thing that I really wanted to try to do is to, you know, stop participating in the petroleum economy to the extent that I could, um, you know, get off the grid and all that kind of stuff. And, and then um, at, at a certain point, I realized that wasn't enough and and that's when I had to really learn how to get out of my own way in terms of my you know overcome my shyness and my my uh, my fear about you know being in front of people or speaking out or showing up um, for things um, and that was it was a challenge it was a challenge but when you're doing it in defense of something that you love then it it's not hard you know what I mean and I mean it's a lot harder if you're just going like. I'm just going to do it so I can be more famous or, you know, so I can look really hot in this dress or whatever. I don't know, you know, I don't know what they do it for. But, um, 
but you know, um, uh, uh, but if you if you're going and you're doing something and you're trying to share information so that people can know that they don't have to be a slave to petroleum, or you, the people can know that they, we are blowing up our mountain ranges, our ancient, most ancient mountain ranges in the Appalachians, or whatever it is that you're sharing information about solutions, uh, all that stuff, then it's it makes life it makes it a lot easier, and um, so I've, I've been able to become a lot more comfortable with that and um, and then so that's sort of the sort of my my beginnings of evolution uh, in terms of becoming more proactive were really around um, around sh sharing information and then sort of got spurred into direct action by this one over here <laughs> Wow, it's just not, so not what I expected to hear from an actress <laughs> being shy and, <laughs> and all that. I mean, I mean that's the number one fear, right? It's public speech, you know, sort of like to hear that from an actress is quite a surprise for me. And I just really love your. I mean, I'm like melting. Listen to the story here, and I just, you know, I mean, how like you described growing in a big tall building and our attitude these days is is basically we're against nature. You know, we're mostly bacteria. We depend on bacteria to stay alive, yet we just want to kill, kill bacteria. We absolutely have this attitude that, you know, is us against nature somehow, you know, and, and then being living in nature is uncomfortable. And uh, back to the perceived values, right, sort of again, so we are sort of like, as, as a society, we've certainly been fed that, that line. And, and in some ways, it is comfortable, right? So we, we, we do see, I mean, we do, I mean, I always say the couch, couch potato principle rules the universe. <laughs> We want to do things the easiest way possible. I mean, so there's that piece of us that falls for that. It's very seductive, you know, to live yes. in a building, to be shielded from all that yeah. stuff. And so, and you're absolutely right. And we, we have to really, like both of you have shared that importance of connecting with nature. How are you going to care about Earth if you live in a cement block? You know, it's like, what's Earth? <laughs> we have no relation to it. And I just... No, that's great. Your your stories, it's amazing. I like to say that our Achilles heel as a species is our our ad addiction to instant gratification. And Julia was saying that it's our addiction also to comfort. You know, um, but you know, it's a kind of I guess a combination of of those things that really, you know, m makes us somehow unable to remember the ramifications of our actions or our inactions. You know, and so that sort of, you know, couch potato, like we're just gonna, you know, make our, keep ourselves comfortable and keep, you know, get, get, getting what we need now, bigger, more, faster, better, you know, all that is, is just uh, working against us so much. You're absolutely right. So you both are mentioning addiction. I mean, that's the nature of addiction. It's like most of us really at some level, all of us really know what we're doing is damaging the environment, but that's the characteristic of addic addiction, isn't it? We, you know, we're, I mean, how many of us do things we know that's not good for us, you know, and, uh, and that's, that is what addiction is. You, you're, you're interested in the pleasure now and really don't care what happens later. And, and that's sort of like, you know, in a way that we have to first acknowledge that before we're able to really kind of deal with that. So thank you. So. Uh, you should speak to that. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. No, I got some. Okay. I was making sure she had some tea. You want me to speak to what the addiction piece? Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, I I can actually speak with real life experience to the addiction piece because I am an addict. I was during that when I talked about my time of being very self destructive, I was addicted to drugs and alcohol, like severely, and I was very addicted to drugs and alcohol because I'm a very sensitive person in a very brutal and violent world, and I didn't have tools to deal with that, and so I self medicated with drugs and alcohol for over a five year period. And over those five years got worse and worse and worse. And actually even became a dealer, a drug dealer to support my habit. So I was like hardcore because I don't do anything halfway. <laughs> you know, like climate tree for a week, pshaw. <laughs> you know? So, so I can actually speak with authority on addiction because I'm an addict. And actually we all are. We just don't really get it. But like I, I am, I actually, you know, I am what is recognized by society as an addict. But one of the interesting things about addicts too is like when you approach them with that they have a problem, they're like, I don't have a problem. 
What happens when people approach Americans <laughs> with our <laughs> addictive behavior? We don't have a problem. It's those countries over there. I know. Let's go invade and drop bombs. You know, like, I, I was, it's, it's just extraordinary. And then the other thing about addicts is they don't change, uh, they do not change except for, for one of two things, either crisis or inspiration. And the crisis sometimes is death. And I think that's part of what motivates me to get up on stages is I would like for us not to kill ourselves as a species. Like, I, I think that for all of our mess of our humanity, there's also some beauty in us. And I think it'd be cool if we could hang out on this planet for a little while longer. But the way we're behaving, that we are like mainlining drugs that are really bad for us at this point. We're not just an occasional user. We've got IVs of oil and disposability and massive energy consumption running right into those veins, you know? So we're and, like... <laughs> and we're taking down so many other species, species with, with us. us you yeah. know? Let's make a song. <laughs> <laughs> So that, you know, that's unfortunately, it's kind of the direction we're heading in, but the other thing that can transform an addict's life is inspiration. They, they see something else as possible and they begin to shift their behavior. And I think that that is, po that is so important for those of us who do care about our world and do care about the earth and the animals and all the people, not just a select few group of people, that we it's really easy to create blame. It's really easy to point fingers. It's really easy to be judgmental. It takes no creativity or brilliance to be those things. But if we want to, you know, if we want to transform an addicted society, doing those things doesn't work. It actually doesn't. And so it actually calls upon us to create, not just talk about, though they're talking about is important, to actually create an inspiring solution that's so alive that people go, ooh, maybe that actually is better than what I have. Maybe being able, maybe all beings being able to breathe clean air regardless of income is a really good idea. Maybe all beings being able to eat healthy food regardless of income is a good idea. Maybe all beings who want to be creative and artistically self-expressed having the opportunity to do that is a good idea. Like these ideas of what it is to have a really healthy world that works for all, it's happening. But we don't see it enough, we don't experience it enough. So those of us who care, I think it is important to point out what's not working, but it's actually even more important to point out what is and to embody it and to create it and to share it. And as Daryl says, um, create the party. Uh, throw a better party. <laughs> <laughs> right? Well, you, you know, you want it, like, I mean, if, if, if you want to get people to come on down, you got to have a better party, you know? And the truth is, is that, you know, food that doesn't have poisons in it tastes better. And, you know, a house that isn't built out of, like, poisons or, like, uh, many schools, you know, are built by the same people who build prisons, you know? Like, places that aren't built as, like, prisons and, and aren't built with toxic materials and that, that, that incorporate, you know, our natural systems that incorporate like the the genius of those natural systems really uh, are, feel better. They smell better. They're funner. Everything about it is better. So that's the way you win people over, not by going, oh well, you know, you're not a good person if you don't recycle, you know, or you should really feel bad because your car gets less mileage than my car, or uh, any of that stuff. That doesn't that doesn't get people to come on down. And yelling and screaming at them either doesn't do it. You know, it's like just you know, have a better time and everyone wants to come over, you know. I I, I was telling Julia <clears throat> the other day about some different wild animals that I had had the opportunity to play with and one of them was a, a pack of dolphins and the only way that I ever have experienced that dolphins will come over to check you out um, if you're just like swimming without fins, you can't even possibly go catch a dolphin, you know, you're just swimming around, is if you're having a fun time. If you're having a great time, they'll be like, hey, what's going on over here? Is what's going, can, I, can I come and hang out? With, what, 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 let me play with you too, you know, hey, check out this. And then they'll play. And that's, I think, you know, we identify a lot with those creatures because they have a lot of that playful spirit that we have. And, and if we're having a good time, you know, people want to come join. That's just the way it is. Well, that's great. I and mean, I also really liked uh, uh, what you're saying about, you know, absolutely we're all addicts, right? You know, you know legal addict on, 
not illegal addicts, we all are addicts. And we all are familiar with 12 step, right? Step one is to recognize you got a problem. Most of us don't, you know, it's like, oh, the big corporations, the governments, it's not, it's not me. Little people can't do anything, you know? And I mean, you hear this all the time, you know, it's, it's really, a, you know, the externalizing. It's sort of like we, no, no, nobody sees themselves as bad, and we're all like, look deep down, we are all really good people. Then why is there all this darkness out there? We project it outside, you know, sort of like, unless we begin to each take a little piece of that in, that we are never going to dissolve that darkness out there because it's really in here that we're projecting out. So, I mean, you're, you're absolutely, I mean, I absolutely agree with you, it's absolutely an addiction. But 12 step, step, step one, I, mean, I hear that you, do, you know, inspire people, absolutely. You know, punishment never works anyway. In fact, that's what we need to do. We need to go from an eye to an eye to forgiveness. And that's, that's the major shift we have, really have to arrive at. But then, could, do you have some ideas of, of like, how do you get people to see that, to get step one? That, that, that we're all lying to ourselves. If you don't recognize you're an addict, you're lying to yourself. That's a major lie. So how do you, how do you get people to see that? I mean, it's one thing, yeah, that's a part of it. You know, we've, I think a, a lot of it is too that being addicted to comfort, being addicted to the easy way is also learning is fun. No, everything is fun. I mean, there's one set aspect of everything, but there's also aspects of elbow grease that you have to put in. There's hard work. Hard work is not perceived as fun. You know, sometimes living, you have to live outside. You know, it's a big storm coming. You're in a huddling out. It's not perceived as fun. So there's aspect of life that's not fun. I mean, certainly having a steering wheel in your head and having to come through all of that is not fun, right? So um, we can't have date light all the time, right? When you're always laughing, then you, you get tired. It's not fun anymore, right? So, so, so how do you then, how do you like really, I mean, we can't, we can't externalize that part of it either, you know? And so how do you sort of approach that? And hey, we have to embrace all of it. You know, life is full of not fun experiences. And then recognizing that you've been lying to yourself, that you're an addict, is certainly not fun. So how do you, how do you approach that? I mean, I, I have no answer, so I'm asking you. <laughs> In today's society, there's a, there's a lot of ways to share information and visuals and things like that. My experience is that we do need to be in touch with the very real harm that we are causing to others and then ultimately to ourselves. And so if it's all just fun and light and pretty and you know, dancing through the daisies in the field, you don't get present to the impact of the addiction. So I, I feel that at least for me, part of it has been what, the way for me to get people present, myself included, to our own, all of our own addiction, is to get us really present to feeling the care and feeling the connection because otherwise we're just going to shut down to it. And I think that images and stories are very powerful for that. You know, it's like a lot of people couldn't grasp the concept of 97% of the ancient redwoods are cut down and we're still cutting them down. Like people couldn't, some people just weren't there yet. They couldn't get that our choices around wood are a part of what's destroying the last of these ancient trees that have been here for millions of years and might possibly go extinct because of our choices. That was too big to disconnect for people. So <clears throat> my choosing to live in one and be open about my experience and go through this wild journey created a bridge for people to like tap into something within themselves. There's these powerful pictures of Daryl in Ecuador where we both have been where they're drilling for oil and they leave these unlined oil pits in the middle of the jungle where people live sometimes and they're just, they pull out the oil and they just leave the sludge right there, this toxic sludge. And there's this picture of Daryl where she put her hand in the oil and put, you know, holds it up and there's this picture of it. And it just makes it very real. And I, I feel like that, like I try, I try to use a lot of creating visuals through words. So I do things like tell people, one of the biggest windows, one of the biggest magnifying glasses into all of our addiction is that we have this sentence called, I'm going to go throw something away. Where is a way? Right? There actually isn't an away. There is very real impact on the planet and oftentimes on very real people's lives because there's, a, there's people who often deal with our wasteful 
destructive behaviors. And they live in places that they don't have the same environmental or human rights protection laws. So we're actually oppressing and destroying and creating violence against people when we throw something away as well. Very real people. And so like things like that to me, when I say that, even in like communities of folks who are not even remotely in this conversation, when I say, you're going to throw something away, where is a way? Everybody goes, oh. <laughs> you know, so that's, that's like one thing. And then helping create like the impact for people of when you are going to get your coffee and it's in a paper cup, a tree got cut down for that. If you had to go and listen to a tree get cut down every time you used a paper cup, paper plate, paper napkin, paper towel, paper bag, do you think your actions might shift? If you had to go walk through a clear cut every time you did that, the plastic lids on those paper cups for your coffee, the plastic to-go containers, plastic cups, plastic bags, if you had to go walk in the unlined oil pits in Ecuador like she and I have, where obviously plastic is a byproduct of petroleum. If you had to go walk in that pit, and like I did, and not speaking for Daryl, but like meeting with people whose children were covered in sores because the only water they have to play in is now polluted and they're just covered in sores. If you had to look at that and hold the plastic in your hand, would your action change? So I feel that that's the best way to help us as addicts get present to accepting our addiction is to get present without judgment. Like I do my best even when I share these things, like I just have nothing but complete compassion in my heart that I think most of us would never ever want to go clear cut a forest. We would never ever want to go look at a mom with her child covered in wounds and have to sit there and know that we caused that. We, I don't think at our hearts we are that kind of a species. But our actions, we are that kind of a species. So if we can get present in a non-judgmental way, because when, when we feel judgment, we shut down. Judgment kills off life. If I'm trying to protect life, I can't do it by killing it off. I jokingly call it when we get granolier than thou. And, you know, instead of holier than thou, we get granolier than thou. It's like, oh, yeah, well, I do this. Oh, yeah, well, you do that. Oh, my God, you know. So, like, that doesn't work. But if we can get all of ourselves, myself included, because there's no perfect choice. Every day I'm living in this world trying to ask myself, what is the best choice that I can make in this moment? If I get too attached to being perfect, I wear myself out. Because I can't be perfect in the world today, but I can go on this experiment of can I shift this behavior or that behavior? What can I do next that has my life be a little bit more in alignment with the world I care about? And for me, anyway, I think that's the best way to have us wake up to our addiction because when we start to feel it, then we can start to heal it. And it doesn't happen. We cannot heal if we don't feel. Yeah, absolutely right. We have to connect to the to the information in an emotional way. And then of course, like you said, without judgment, that's a really important piece. But it's so deeply in our psyche, the eye and the eye of sort of like sort of way of looking at things is so deeply ingrained in us. I mean for me personally, I've been just like sort of We've all known that intellectually forever, but being able to really see it, how it affects my behavior, how it really sort of my new things, really indirect things, I'm still deeply ingrained to it in an eye and an eye kind of like psyche, you know, like, and it's really hard, it's like really have to look at magnifying glass to see how it's showing up in my life. And I think that's a really big piece, really. I mean, we really need to shift away from that. Just like you said, when we feel judgment, we shut down. It's the judgment that makes us deny. Oh, that's you no know, because we cannot deal with the judgment. And like you said, deep in our heart, you no, know, we're, we're not that kind of people. But our actions are because we're so disconnected from it because we can't own up to it because that judgment that comes with it, and we can't deal with that. And you're 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 absolutely right. And it's, I'm so loving this conversation. Thank you so much. And Daryl, you were going to say something. Sorry. <clears throat> this is something that, that I heard Julia say in the last couple of days, which is also, you know, about judging ourselves, that, you know, it's like, uh, it's, it, that's a, a hard, you know, a hard thing to remind yourself not to, not to do, is like to, you know, to, to make choices, you know, when, with, that are informed and to realize that, you know, every choice you make or don't make is a choice. Every single thing you do or don't do is an action. So, you know, Julia was saying the other day, she's like, we all are activists, whether we 
want, think so or not, because everything we do is an action. And whether it's an action towards a world you want to manifest or an, an action that you think isn't an action, you're manifesting something every moment of every day, right? But, but also that, that judgment of, of yourself, that's, you know, that can be very limiting, you know? So it's better just to, 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 to take every moment for, for its, and every opportunity for a, to, to know that every moment is an opportunity to make a choice to, to manifest the world that you want to see. And, and, and rather than going, oh, God, you know, I, I so suck because I did this or that. You know, it just doesn't do you any good, you know? Oh, absolutely, yeah. And, and I'm, you know, we need to recognize judgment is discernment. So you know how you can do it better. Mistakes are teachers, you know. It's no point in wasting time. Like, oh, am I bad? You know, that doesn't do us any good at all. And nature doesn't work that way at all. So, and I really appreciate also both of you are pointing out that there is no perfect way right now because the system that's operating doesn't allow, is, the system in itself is not sustainable. So you cannot live a sustainable life within the current system. So I think that's a lot of us need to recognize that you can't, you know, you cannot, you know, because the way things are set up and we need to create a completely different, manifest a different world through our actions. Mm -hmm. like you said. And there, but there are a lot of amazing and fantastic solutions out there that are available to us currently. And really to every single one of the crises that we face, we already have solutions to. And uh, we just need sort of the will to employ them and also for the information to get out there to be made available to everybody. But we really have all the tools that we need right now to begin to to make these changes and you know there's certainly room for you know innovation and and, and improvement on accessibility and affordability of certain things but but already we have the tools that we need to address all the crises that we face well all we really need to ship is in here <laughs> so um so anyone want, would like to uh, make a comment or ask a question from the audience we have mics I think there's one mic for anybody. There's two. There's one on this side and one on this side. And oh, if you want, thank you. Even if there's more than one of you, if you want to go ahead and come up, just because the more who are ready to ask come a question, the more we can have the involvement of all of you. So if you have something to ask, or if you have something you want to add to the conversation too, it's totally cool to just add your your view and your your thoughts into the conversation as well. Great. Go ahead. Hello, my name is Artist Knox. Uh, I have a question about uh, when you were in the tree, how did you measure the time for the two years? Did you count it by day, by minute, or did it just all run together? How did you keep yourself there and dedicated without allowing the focus of the outside world to interfere with your hindsight, you know? Oh, that's a great question, thank you. Yeah, like, <clears throat> it was interesting because there were some days that felt like they stretched on forever, and then other days where it felt like, boom, the day was gone, <laughs> you know, and everything in between. And uh, it was funny because I wasn't keeping track of days, and other people were. And uh, and I like I remember when somebody's like, "I think you're coming up on an anniversary," and I'm like, "I am," <laughs> you know, like it just wasn't present for me. But at the same time, early on, about three months into the tree sit, it started. Media started showing up, and it started to become a global story. So then I actually did have to start paying attention because I had to do things like interviews. I had a solar-powered phone in the tree that I used to talk all over the world. And I remember the first, the, 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 the moment I realized something big had changed for me, and a guy was, a journalist was coming up to interview me, and he said, I, you know, I want to bring you something. What would you like? And he figured I'd ask for some kind of food treat or something, you know, or another pair of thermal socks because I was freezing to death up there. And I said, I never thought when I climbed 18 stories up into an ancient redwood, I was going to have to ask for this, but would you please bring me a day planner? <laughs> and he was like, he started laughing, he's like, are you serious? And I said, yeah, unfortunately I am. So I, it was a dance between like being, keeping my commitments to time to this world, but also keeping my commitment to, the, to nature's rhythm, which is a totally different rhythm. It has its own cycles that are based on tides and the moon and uh, so many different things. Nature has its own time. So part of my challenge, so it's a great question, was like, how do I stay accountable to time on the ground and at the same time present to and connected to time in the tree? Thanks for your question. Hi, my question is for you, Julian. My name is Christina. And it's kind of a tree logistical aspect um, of your time spent in the tree. And I'm sure a lot of the folks in here are curious about it. You have to read the book. 
<laughs> yep. You can check it out of a library. <laughs> <laughs> you have to read the book. Yep. Because um, imagine if you lived in an apartment 11 years ago, and now you live in a house, and everybody wanted to ask you how you got your food, how you went to the bathroom, and how you survived. You'd be really freaking bored of talking about it by now. So as much as I love you, and I totally honor the curiosity of that question, I totally get it. I wrote a book about it. You can check it out for free, or you can buy it. It's printed on 100% recycled, post-consumer waste recycled, printed without chlorine bleach, and printed with soy-based inks, so it actually doesn't harm the environment. And 100% of my proceeds from it, of my personal proceeds, I donate. So if you buy the book, you're actually donating to a good cause. Or you can just go online and research Julia Butterfly Hill, Bathroom in a Tree, and you'll find the answer. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Hi, this message, uh, this is for Daryl. Um, I saw you in London in the Seven Year Itch, and you were fantastic. Uh, the reason I'm bringing up London is uh, I'm a vegetarian, vegan, and as I was traveling through, it seems like they care a lot about their buildings. They recycle their buildings, never tear anything down. Uh, their um, forests and their countrysides look beautiful. Is there anything that they're doing that we should be doing here? Well, they're a lot stricter about their uh, genetically modified um, yes. foods. Um, I don't believe that they allow it into their into their grocery stores, and um, we don't even allow we don't even we don't even let people mark if their food isn't genetically modified because then it's not fair to the genetically modified. I mean, it's insane. I mean, we uh, have a, a lot. Um, more lax, you know, I mean, our, our FDA, I don't even know what they're doing. I really don't know what they're doing. It's just the craziest thing. Um, but I, I, uh, I think that um, um, we, we've kind of gone really crazy with our, our food systems over here, you know, with a, after World War II and industrial agriculture came in and um, we've, we've got a lot to learn from uh, the Australians, from the permaculture movement, um, from what's going on now down in Mexico um, in terms of the farmers really liberating themselves from genetically engineered plants and learning how to make biofertilizers and all that kind of stuff and, and, and to really insist upon our right to know what is in our food. Um, there's a great organization called the or, uh, Organic Consumers Association that is has a group called Millions Against Monsanto, and they're doing fantastic work about our right to know. Um, um, and um, uh, also Jeffrey Smith has written a lot of books and has DVDs about genetically modified foods. and. Um, you know, it's really, really scary, and I think that we, we've got to fight those kinds of things. Thank you. And I'd love to add to that, because <clears throat> there's actually solutions around this happening right here in your community, so I want to make sure you're aware. So if you didn't stop by the tables coming in, please make sure and stop by on the way out, because you have the Arroyo Food Co-op, which doesn't have genetically modified food, and it's in the walls of that space, and is promoting as much local and organic and the fair trade. And we invested in a very large corporation. Most of the money leaves our community. So we're actually devaluing our community when we spend our dollars investment in large businesses and not in local businesses. There's also a table out there on Transition Town, which is a fantastic nationwide movement that's happening around people looking at how can our community transition off of oil, transition off of bad addictive behaviors and into healing our community from the ground up and from the inside out. That's happening right here, just launched four months ago. Needs some vital human energy to help transition this town even more and this campus. And then there's also a table on watershed and has all kinds of things that you can learn about your watershed. People we don't realize, you know, our watershed is our community as well. And so getting to know the extended community of the watershed and what you can do to help restore and protect this watershed community. So those are three tables that are out there that are working on these very same things, addressing the problems through creating and modeling the solution. So make sure and stop by the tables if you didn't on the way in. Yeah, and, and uh, food co-op, you know, needs membership. You know, we still need more membership to make it a reality. And speaking of, of heart, um, I became a member a while ago, and 
pure on purely on the dis, on the fact that the person one of the person who sort of been working tirelessly on this was really giving it out of his heart as a community give to the community he sunk his own money many hours and hours of his time and he just he just like it's so inspiring to see someone who's willing to do stuff as a gift to the community. So a lot of people, there's like membership drive has been kind of slow because, well, there's no store yet. What am I getting? You know, why should I pay money? You know, we have to, one of the shifts we have to come from is not from what can I get? You know, it's what, what can I give? You know, that's really how we're going to manifest a different world. So I really invite you, there are different ways of becoming a member. So if we invite you to consider becoming a member, not because something you can get out of it, but to give in a way so we can create a different world altogether and of course in transition town like you know it really takes all of us to really kind of to work together to visualize what this might be because no the thing is no one knows what the new world will look like right I mean we have solutions but you know something new means we don't know what it looks like you know that's what <laughs> new means and that we need to you know we need to co-create this together so um, so we we have um, we really need young people. You now we have here people from campus. We really need young people to be members of these organizations. And a Royal Seco needs as many walkouts demonstrators as possible. <laughs> so please, you know, think about giving. How you can give into the community rather what you can get. Thank you. I ride my bike all over Los Angeles and. Uh, take the train and that's how I got here and I saw everyone in traffic and I was just, I, I don't know, how do people do that? But uh, anyhow, um, I don't blame people for driving and stuff. Some people have a long commute and they have, you know, to kids or whatever to drop off. Um, but I would really love it if people here, if you don't ride a bike or take public transportation to support um, the Los Angeles County Bicycle Coalition to support bike lanes. You yourself, be careful when you dri drive around a, a cyclist. Um, and because <laughs> I've gotten hit several times. Um, and uh, support bike lanes. And uh, the Bus Riders Union is a, an organization, nonprofit, that really supports public transportation in Los Angeles. Um, in, in terms of uh, like keeping our economy locally and keeping our money close by and investing in our own communities. I'm from El Salvador and we uh, don't have a really good economy. Um, it's all based on coffee pretty much and the prices of coffee have gone down. So a lot of Salvadorans here in the U.S. send money down remittances and the people down there, they use it to pay for gasoline and for transporting themselves to work and that's where all their money goes. So it goes straight out of the country uh, that we try to help support and uh, it doesn't pay off for, for us. Um, so uh, anyways, petroleum transportation, it's a big issue. Uh, global warming and all, you know, you exercise on your bicycle, now you don't have to go to the gym uh, and have lots of fun, right? So awesome. thank you very much. Thank you. My, uh, my uncle is a filmmaker, and he made a great documentary on the Bus Riders Union. If you want to check it out, there's a really good film on the Bus Riders Union. It's really inspiring. I think it's called the Bus Riders Union. But his name is Haskell Wexler, and um, he made Medium Cool and a lot of other great documentaries and films and stuff, and I would definitely check that one out. And, um, and I just wanted to let you know that, like, well... N not yet in El Salvador, but Nicaragua has been um, really looking into changing their um, their energy infrastructure and particularly their fueling infrastructure are looking at switching onto 100% alcohol fuel, which they're looking at trying to make from bioremediating waste. So that's pretty encouraging. Cool. Uh, <clears throat> um, mine is more of an addition to the conversation than an actual question, Great. but... I was raised um, like half here and half in Guatemala, which is right above El Salvador. And um, it's funny because like, you know, just adding on to that part where you said, where does the waste go pretty much? Like driving around there, like on a bus with like my grandma, you see them just burning the trash, just like on the side of the freeway or whatever it's called, just burning like tires or whatever. And, you know, um, 
they have, I mean, I don't know if you've ever seen pictures of Guatemala, but it's just super green. It's just beautiful and tropical rainforest and, you know, great and green. But they don't um, emit as much uh, gas and waste and CO2 and O3 or whatever because they have enough trees to kind of like balance that out, you know. So it's not just that we're wasting as, like more, it's also that we're destroying more, you know. So that's all. That's great, thank you. <clears throat> and what's, what's interesting too is, I wish I could remember the name of it at the moment, but it, it, literally as you were talking, it flew out of my head. But there's a great organization working in Guatemala where they're <clears throat> building homes and community centers and hospitals and things. And they actually, they used waste materials for all the insulation in the walls. So they have people going and picking up plastic bottles and stuffing all the trash into the little plastic bottles and then they actually just build a frame and then fill up with these plastic bottles filled with trash and then um, earth plaster around them. And so it's insulation. It's actually, most of our buildings use fiberglass and other toxic things. It's, way, it's actually less toxic than that. Once it's sealed, it's not breaking down. It's just in there providing insulation. Like the earth ships. Yeah, like earth ships. And it's allowing people the opportunity to have a place to live and to have um, schools and all kinds of things. So that's happening in Guatemala, which is, which is fantastic because it's showing us a creative way to solve a problem. And it doesn't mean we should keep producing trash and waste, but if it's there, what is a way we can give it a new life that's healthy for us versus burning it or letting it sit there on the side of the road and ending up in the streams and the rivers and things like that? Great, thanks. Hi. Uh, my question sort of has like two parts. And so first uh, for Daryl, because you've addressed bodies like the United Nations and other political groups or United Nations, what um, kind of response have you gotten when you've been there? And how optimistic are you that groups or institutions like that can create any sort of positive change? And then the second part for everyone is how can we bridge the gap between the dialogue and the conversation that's going on here and then the conversation that's going on in politics and in the mainstream media? Well, um, thank you for your question. Um, uh, first of all, I'm constantly kind of shocked and um, frightened by the fact that, that m me, a uh, sort of somewhat dumb blonde <laughs> actress, <laughs> is sort of more informed that a lot of times than the people who are actually in, in, in charge of, of of you know taking care of some of these things, and that really is terrifying. Um, but I do find that there is a, a, an openness to information. I mean, people are you know are interested, and when they learn when they learn something, people go, "Oh my God, I didn't know that!" You know, so uh, there's a willingness, and it's a not not a partisan thing. I don't. I feel like that everybody that I've uh, been fortunate enough to come into contact with, whether they were, you know, red state, blue state, you know, whatever their politics were, um, have been extremely open, especially when you're presenting, you know, uh, uh, ideas and solutions. Um, on the other hand, you, e even from what I understand at, at all the universities that Julia and I have had the opportunity to visit, you know, bureaucracy is just a mother, you know, whatever. And, um, <laughs> I mean, and it's, and, 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 you know, you can only imagine that is compounded by, you know, so much more when it gets up to, you know, uh, you know, government levels and, and you know, that, that type of thing. So it's, I, I just have never really put my faith into the political system in order for it to be able to change things. Um, there's so many giant hurdles, you know, to, to face. I mean, not the least of which was this law that was enacted last year, the Citizens United versus the FEC, um, that gave all corporations the power of uh, the ability to be acknowledged as a person, right of personhood, right? It gave them First Amendment rights so that they can now, corporations can now, donate as much money as they want to any political candidate, which basically says, whoever they're putting in office is gonna have their agendas at, at their heart. And there's no way that we, as individual people, can really compete against that unless we get that law shut down. So that's a, there's a big uh, movement that is, mo that is uh, uh, in motion to try to get that law reversed. Citizens United versus the FEC, I'd recommend everyone look into it and lend your support. Um, but on the other hand, I, you know, 
I, I really just don't think that's the way, I don't think change ever comes from the top down. It just doesn't seem like that is, has ever worked. You know, they've got too many people they're beholden to and, you know, all these, these walls and stuff. And, you know, change happens from, from people being informed and, ha and saying, you know, uh, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. Or I'm, you know, I'm inspired and I want to, you know, do something in a beautiful way. Or, you know, that, that kind of thing. I mean, the types of things that we've seen happening in Wisconsin, the types of things we've seen happening in Egypt, the, you know, the things that are going on around the world where people have just, you know, that's it. We're done. This is not, this is not acceptable anymore. And actually, I feel that that tipping point on, on uh, the domestic level is actually starting to happen right now with mountaintop removal. There's actually been quite, um, it's just, it's, it keeps building and building. And I really feel like that's about to come to an end. And I, I even think coal is on, on its way out. You know, I mean, I know it's, it's got a, we got a long road ahead of us, but I do think that the death knell, knell for, you know, the, is, of coal has sort of been rung as people are starting to get to understand the, the, the disasters and the, the tragedy of, of the story of coal, you know. So, um, so there, there, that's it. <laughs> yes, and I would, the only thing I would add to that, because I think you covered it perfectly, Daryl, is, uh, I, the thing I always bring forth is the greatest changes in history and herstory have happened when people are willing to put their bodies where their beliefs are. And I love to point to the fact that some, because we, we all know of like civil rights and women's rights and all those kinds of things, but we don't think about the fact that like, the fact that I'm up here as a woman wearing pants is because women took direct action, right? Like women risked and in some cases experienced arrest and, and being really brutally treated for me to have the right to be up here wearing pants, for me to have the right to dress in a way that feels authentic to me, not somebody telling me I need to have covering down to my wrist and up to my neck and you know, like that. Like, if women did direct action for things that we take for granted, like the fact that I can wear pants. I like to climb trees, pants are good for that. You know, like, <clears throat> so, at some point, you know, if we really want things to change, we have to be, what are we willing to risk to be free? And I, one of the things I, that I, I really love to bring forth is that every moment of every day, we're giving our life to something. From the moment we're born till the moment we die, every second of every day, we are giving our life to something. So you're asking people to give to the co-op. We are 100% of the time giving our life to something. What do we want to give our lives to? And what, when we really, if we truly want to see the kind of change that's necessary to turn this country around, it's going to take more people being willing to give their lives to making that world possible. And there's a thing, it's so weird, like people used to always, now you hear people going, well, I hope I don't have to sacrifice for that. And I'm thinking, you know, sacrifice used to be like this holy, noble gesture, you know, what a great thing that you were willing to sacrifice and that you were able to sacrifice, or that you were able, allowed to sacrifice for something. You know, and now it's like, oh my God, don't sacrifice, that would be horrible. <laughs> it's so strange. <laughs> Well, it is really interesting. So, like, um, I mean, I also wonder, like, he's, you asked a great question that all three of us want to answer. <laughs> and, um, you know, you connect between here and the mainstream, you know, media and politics. That conversation is in mainstream in media and in politics. Haven't you noticed everybody's green these days? I mean, <laughs> you see that in commercials. All big businesses are green. I mean, which is really points out something that unless we really change, shift in here, you would just be co-opted, you know, green is another commodity. I mean, there's all kinds of laws, but coal is all exempt from all the laws, you know. You know, Clean Water Act does not have anything to do with coal. You know, coal is exempt. It's completely meaningless, you know. And, and the whole idea about sacrifice and risk and risk something, you know, a revolution. I mean, all of us will understand that we need to have a revolution. People talk about green revolution that's going on. But someone pointed this out, it's really interesting, that if you look at back at history, Every revolution, there's a group, there's some kind of loss, right? Someone has to suffer a loss. 
But it, nobody's losing anything right now in this green, <laughs> green revolution, and that tells us something, you know. And we have to risk, and we have to so-called sacrifice. And I think ultimately, the environmental movement is really a movement towards self-love. You know, is an addict does not have self-love. An addict is an expression of lack of self-love. And we are because of our materialistic um, availability, what we, uh, the way that we're able to live this way it sort of promotes and makes us narcissistic. And narcissistic is not self-love. Narcissistic serves to separate us from others and not connect us. So, you know, here is this, you know, so I, I love you know, what you guys are saying. I mean, it's absolutely, you know, it's, top is not gonna do anything down, absolutely. So thank you for your question. Thank you for waiting. Sure. Uh, my name's Christine Lenches Hinkle, and I just wanted to reach out and say thank you so much for coming out. Um, I, I definitely uh, connect with you and identify with what you're saying, and just your transparency and genuineness and sharing your own experiences from when you were kids <laughs> all the way up to now. I mean, that's why I came out was to get inspired and hear you guys talk and um, just keep doing what I feel like I. I need to be doing, and Ling, we've met um, a couple of times, but I, I came here to get even more inspired, and so part of my question um, relates to how do you keep, keep yourselves inspired? Uh, Julia, two years? My God. <laughs> In a, and how did you keep doing it? Because I did go out on a limb three years ago. Um, I left my job, and I started up a whole new business around doing what you guys are saying, and I'm still not there yet. Um, and it is my calling, I feel it's the, it, it is the direction it needs to go, but fr from women, I wanna hear how, how, giving me something to take home to keep doing what I'm doing. And what I am doing, my mission is keeping organics out of the landfill and to really push composting on a much grander scale. There's a huge issue with the food waste that we just are not talking about. We don't know where this away, away is the landfill for us right now. And it's creating these huge impacts. Um, and so I have turn my family life upside down to, to push this forward. So I'd like to hear from you, Julia, and then also the second part is um, your take on greenwashing. Yes, there's a whole green revolution going on, and there's lots of resources and lots of good products, eco products, and there are some good, some bad, and the greenwashing, people may not even have heard this term before, but if maybe you guys can speak out on that, and um, yeah, so two prong. Any, any more words of advice from such powerful women to keep me going, doing what I'm doing, and then the whole greenwashing thing. Great, thank you. Thanks for what you're doing around compost, too, because yeah. it's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. uh, can I do a plug? Absolutely. <laughs> waste Less Living. It's a, an organics recovery, eco-party planning, a zero waste uh, a consulting company. So if you are putting on an event, um, you can call us. We are local, so we would love for you to support us. But we want to be educating um, the consumer about the new uh, product line that's out on the market, the compostable tableware. Not all compostable tableware is actually compostable. Not all biodegradable tableware is compostable. But we are um, on a mission to actually bring industrial composting to Pasadena. So um, we're figuring all of this stuff right out right now, but we're educating. We're more educators than we are um, uh, 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 product pushers. So um, waste less living. Great. Wonderful. Good promo. <laughs> Uh, so the green, I'll cover the greenwashing thing first, just really quickly, which is, it's, we, we all have to do our homework. We just have to. I mean, even organic standards has all kinds of exemptions and clauses and this is and that's in it. So the, the only solution to greenwashing is get informed ourselves and, in, and encourage others to be informed in the choices that we make. That's really the only solution because is as long as people can buy whatever they want and, and it's shown as if it's fact, then we don't know any better. And we, you know, the fact that we, that they're not allowed to label, don't have GMOs, you know, like there are so many of these things. I saw a, a, 
are a bovine growth hormone free milk and they put that on the milk and then they had to put a little asterisk with a statement that says the FDA has proven that there's not the distinct difference between the blah 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 and I was like oh man you know like and they, the only way they could say that they don't have the hormone in it was to have that little clause on the label on the on the milk so um, you know it, it is it, we ha right now our only solution to greenwashing is be informed and do everything we can to inform those around us and give each other good access like you're doing around the difference between what kind of compostables are out there and biodegradables are out there so uh, we need to do that and and one of the things I, I I like to tell people is yes media can play an important role but I think we need to do more turning off our televisions and going out into our communities and telling a vision <laughs> like, <you know? laughs> so, so, and that's not a vision doesn't live in everything that's wrong in the world, right? It's like visions live in what's right in the world. Visions are not this is broken and this is bad. And not that we don't want to inform each other about what isn't working, but the vision has to be, but these are the solutions to these things that aren't working. So that's what I'll say about the greenwashing piece. Go. <laughs> you, you know, I, I went to a conference a few years ago, and it was called Lifestyles of Health and Sustainability, and I was like, yeah, that's awesome. And I invited all these really brilliant people who are doing, are sort of on the forefront of each of their the areas of creating a, 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 new, a better world, a new world, and um, to be on a panel with me. And when I got there, I'd never led a panel before, so I was going to all the other panels and thinking, this will be really interesting. And then I realized every single panel and every single person who was attending was a representative of one of the big Fortune 500 companies or you know the GEs and the uh, Toyotas and all the different, and they were all there to learn how to find words and images and marketing tools in order to take advantage of this burgeoning interest in actually living a health a lifestyle of health and sustainability. Well, the good news, I mean, obviously I was like, I'm in the lion's den, I'm in hell, I gotta get out of here. And I was trying to get all my people rallied and to get out of there, I was, I was so freaked out. And then my friend, uh, Frank, who's a rabble rouser, was like, you've got to stay here. These people need this message more than anybody, you know? And so we stayed. But it was really frightening and really uh, disheartening and upsetting and everything. And uh, obviously, since then, I have seen the, all of those ads take off. And everybody's, you know, eco this, green that, uh, sustainability. Was a high, well, I don't actually use mo those words anymore because they've been so co-opted. But the good news about it is that there's a reason that they, everyone's trying to sell themselves as it because there's a real, real, genuine appetite to living a life of health and sustainability. And it's, and it's, and it's everywhere and everyone recognizes that they would rather have an apple that's grown with all of nature's enzymes and vitamins and nutrients that it is intended to rather than a bunch of poisons to feed to their children and babies and themselves. So, so I think that there's, you know, greenwashing is here. It's going to stay because, you know, like nobody owns those words. No, so we, the, they've lost their meaning, really. You know, we need to create, we need to, f and also, you know, all of these sort of eco green and all kind of leaves out the other aspects of the picture, you know, the slavery uh, and the other species, uh, the oceans and the creatures that live in the oceans. It doesn't take, take into account the whole big picture, the interdependence of all things, you know, human, human interests, other interests of other well, well, other species, and 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 the environment, you know. So, and that's it's it's all one thing, you know. So I, I I think while greenwashing is is incredibly prevalent and and very disturbing, um, it's it's we, we almost have to just you know kind of shine it and and like Julia said you know just do your research because now there is actually ways to get information on how you know things are made and what works and what doesn't and there's a lot more access to goods and services than when I started to try to get off the grid and get things in line and thank you so much for composting that's rad composting rules and just keep keep focusing on what you love and you're going to get there because the, you, your passion is beautiful. We can feel it. And, and I, I, I think what you're doing is amazing. And I would say that to answer the question about inspiration, I'll try and keep it short because I feel like there's all these other things that want to come through. Um, <clears throat> 
doing what we love and offering what we love is crucial. When people say, I'm inspired, what do I do? I always ask, what do you love to do? And find a way to offer that. Find, you know, if you're an artist, find a way to offer that and make a difference. If you're a teacher, find a way to offer that and make a difference. If you love compost, because nature teaches us that there's no such thing as waste. Waste is food in the natural world. You know, offer that. So it really, it's truly important that we source from what we love because the embers do get low on the hearth fire sometimes. It's like the winds of life are blowing and we're like, don't blow out my last little ember, please. Just a last little ember. And so if we do what we love, it also attracts other people to us that help us go, you can go little ember. <laughs> and then the other piece is we always, we will always find what we're looking for. So if we look for inspiration, we will find it. We all know that there's days when we wake up in the morning and we're grumpy, and if we don't get an attitude adjustment, we go out into the world and the world gives us a hundred reasons of proof of why the world sucks and we're grumpy, right? <laughs> like, the world shows up and like proves grumpy is the right choice, right? But if we wake up grumpy and we get an attitude adjustment and we go out in the world, we'll find some mini miracles in the day that make us feel better. But either way, it's because of what we're looking for. So I talk to you about every day I do a mindfulness practice where I literally put on my glasses of inspiration. I'm putting on my inspiration glasses. I'm looking for something to be inspired by. And because of that, it happens to me all the time and usually in the places we don't expect it, which I live a lot of time on public transportation too because I don't own a car. And there's a lot of opportunities to either be bummed out or inspired on public transportation. And I'm telling you, whichever glasses you're going to wear is going to drastically <laughs> alter the experience. So that's the, the last thing I'll say about inspiration is if we are committed to finding inspiration, it will show up over and over and over again, and it will begin to show up in the small and unexpected places because we're looking for it. Hi. Well, I first wanted to quote Ling, who tells all of her students that um, in order to change anybody, you change yourself first, and in order to change any of they, you gotta change yourself. And like, you guys are all perfect examples. I mean, you guys have changed yourselves, and then in turn are changing others. Um, my question is, um, how do you guys, what do you guys do on a day-to-day -day basis to live a more sustainable life? Like, Daryl, I know you work in the film industry. How is it like working in an industry that's so wasteful? What do you do day-to-day um, -to, -day to live sustainably? Um, yeah, the film industry is really, really bad. And there's actually a, a group uh, organization that I'm on the board of called the Environmental Media Association, which is created a set of standards for productions and uh, competitions as well, but they, they've, you know, basically gotten almost every studio now to either do paperless or, or print, you know, double size of the page and the scripts have gone from, you know, being big and single page to this and, and most of it is recycled now and then also to get rid of, you know, sort of a rider, I guess, for productions to, you know, to get them off of, you know, disposable water bottles and all styrofoam and all that kind of junk that used to permeate movie sets and really see a lot of uh, sets and a lot of studios actually adopting some of those guidelines because it's also about information. A lot of them just, this is the way we've done it. We don't know any different. So just getting them the information and helping, um, giving them access to those resources and goods and services has been really helpful and there are even production companies now which will use you know biodiesel generators and stuff like that but it definitely the movie movie industry has a long way to go still um, in terms of you know me personally um, I try not to use petroleum in my cars um, I have the Kill Bill Trans Am it runs on alcohol fuel um, and I and I have a, a 1984 El Camino that runs on both biodiesel and straight veggie oil um, and uh, I've got solar power at my house. I've got a bunch of rescue critters and a garden. Um, uh, and um, I, I uh, took a permaculture course last year and uh, that was amazing. I learned so much stuff, um, which I'm you know, try trying to incorporate more into my, my life and my garden. And um, uh, I guess, I don't know kind of thing, you know, I mean, carry around these things and, you know, kind of, um, I don't know, <laughs> uh, try, try to, you know, either wear hand-me-downs or, or get stuff at the thrift store. Hmm. Nice. Thank you. <laughs>
No, I, I mean, I, I think that I'd rather just move on, you know, to the next question, not because I'm trying to avoid it, but because it's the same thing. I just about, it's just about looking at every choice and saying, what is the best choice I can make in this moment? So I carry the reusable water bottle, uh, mug, to-go container, you know, utensils, napkin, all that. Um, when I fly, I offset my carbon, even though I don't really believe in offsetting carbon as the solution, I'm clear that I am having a carbon footprint when I fly. So I purchase wind power from a company called Native Energy that's a majority native-owned company because I believe a lot of the environmental devastation that we cause is also linked to very real people, native and indigenous peoples. And we've stolen not only from the earth, we've stolen from these people. So I found this great company where I can offset my carbon and not only give back to the earth, but I'm giving back to people as well. Um, so there's things like that. It's just like an inquiry every day when I come up against a new edge and go, is there a way to shift this edge into a way that's more in alignment with my values and my views? I like that idea of inquiry, right? I think that's, like you said, we all have to do our homework and we all co create together. And we all live in Southern California. Water is a big issue. One easy thing is to, you know, have a bucket by your sink, you know, and take your bucket out to water the plants. You know, when I take a shower or a bath, you know, it's, it's kept in the, in the tub and I use it to flush the toilet, you know. So all kinds of things we can do. I mean, what is exciting is when you can start thinking about it and think, you know, figure out things that you can do and share that with others. And that's what really makes it exci exciting, right? Yeah. Thanks. This person. Hi, um, my name is Marcy Fabula. I'm actually a writer for The Courier here at PCC. Um, I have a two-part question. My first question is for Daryl and Julia. What or who initially um, brought you two together prior to traveling around and having these discussions aside from your uh, green passion? And my second question is, could you list some organizations that you two are very fond of? You want me to talk about how we met? So we actually, I had known about Daryl for a while because of hearing about how she was really living the ideas that we hear a lot of in the Hollywood community people talking about but not necessarily living it. And when I heard of this woman who was living it, I was like, that's my kind of person. And so I had a chance to meet her at an event in LA and as events are, we had like two seconds to connect, but I just came up to her. I was like, I just want you to know I'm so grateful for who you are in this world. Like I'm, I'm so grateful to this woman who's sitting beside me. Like she doesn't have to be up on this stage. She, ha she doesn't have to, to talk about what it is she does. She doesn't have to do direct action when she does now and has gotten arrested for what she believes. Like she could be living a much different life and she cares about this earth and she cares about the critters and she cares enough about us that she's up here. And I wanted to tell her that in person, which I've done a lot of times because I love telling her, tell her, say, Daryl, you rock, thank you. <laughs> So I went up to her at the event, it was like basically like all that, like you rock, thank you so much. And she was like, oh no, no, you're so great. And we were both like, oh, you're both so great. And I hugged each other and got pulled away. And, um, and then what happened after that? Uh, I'll tell, I'll tell. <laughs> so, I, well, I had, I had of course read about Julia when she was in Luna and I was just, I just thought it was the greatest thing ever. And for a long time, I probably hadn't, didn't meet her for years after she was up there. And I, for a long time, I was just like, one day I'll figure out what my butterfly is, you know, because I would just sort of refer to her, her gesture, you know, the, the fact that she sat in Luna with such a beautiful, clear, simple, but yet complex statement and lesson to me, you know, and it, 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 it just affected me so profoundly and I've, I just, I'm still waiting for her to find my butterfly, you know, that, that thing that will speak so clearly about the things that I feel so passionate about. But anyway, so I was really, really excited to meet her and then, you know, we kind of like, hello, and then we kind of maybe saw each other, met each other a couple more times, but then I got a call from her, oh, um, that there was some urgent need for, for some help uh, in a situation that was going on in downtown LA, and I had just begun um, a couple of months before making video blogs for my website, which was on, uh, you know, trying to get people inspired about sustainable solutions and and interconnectedness of all creatures. And so I was like, oh, okay, great. Well, the most effective thing I can do is to go down and make a video blog about it. And then, so I went down, I'm gonna go make a video blog about it and then go home and, you know, be all cozy. And then I go down there and I make a video blog about the South Central Farm, which was the largest urban farm in, it sounds like you guys know about it, so. Um, but anyway, so 
I went down there to make a video blog about it, and I was so moved by this beautiful Garden of Eden that these people had created and how they were feeding their families and the whole community and how they created a safe haven for the children and the birds and the butterflies and the bees and, the, and it was just, it was like, it was exactly how things need to happen for this world that we want to manifest to create livable cities and it was just a perfect, perfect gem of an example of how that works in, real, in the real world. And I, I was so moved that I was like, oh crap, what am I going to do with my El Camino? Because I know if it stayed there, it would get confiscated if it stayed on the land. And I was going to, so I could always just sleep in the back of the El Camino, but I had to like get that out of there. But I ended up staying. And even though I have vertigo, I ended up learning how to climb a tree and ended up sleeping on a platform up in the tree for you know three and a half weeks and then ended up in county. So <laughs> that's where we really got to know each other. <laughs> And real quickly, the organization thing, I'll just mention a couple. I think that the most important organizations are the one, not that they're all not important, but for us here, it's more about like getting connected to our community. That's what's most important. So the, the three groups that are out tabling start there because that's what's happening right here. And, and really that is, if we look at what's going to help heal the problem, the problem has been created by bigger, better, faster now, which means the solution is going to be here, you, me, us, Slow, plant, be, grow. That's the solution. So I'd say for this area, the best groups are highlighted by three groups tabling right, right outside. Thanks. Good evening, Julia, Daryl, and friends. Um, I'm happy to hear Daryl mention that, that the Appalachians are ancient mountains. It turns out the other mountain range that's most ancient in the USA is the klamath Siskiyou bioregion, which happens to be just east of the North Coast Redwoods. Um, and so as mentioned, genetically modified food, unfortunately Obama and Vilsack's US Department of Agriculture approved a few new genetically modified crops lately, alfalfa, which might doom the organic dairy industry, sugar beets once again, another kind of corn to, specifically designed to make ethanol, and then they approved the first commercial planting of a biofarm crop, grow rice with human genes in a field in Kansas to grow human breast milk proteins. And so my question, oh, and then the FDA may approve genetically engineered salmon at any time, try to get Boxer to uh, urge them to drop that plan to approve it. And my question, or if either of you want to comment on either the proposal by Caltrans and the Federal Highway Administration to widen, realign Highway 101 through Richardson Grove State Park and Ancient Redwood State Park in Southern Humboldt County so these giant trucks can come from port areas to further industrialize the North Coast, at, or, or regarding the South Central Farm, which I guess was just mentioned, <laughs> southcentralfarmers.com. And, yeah, and .org, either one, southcentralfarmers.org and wildcalifornia.org to sign the petition to stop Caltrans from widening Highway 101, where, where they're saying they won't cut down ancient trees, but by widening the road, at the very least, they're going to impact the roots, and redwoods rely on root systems, and their root systems are very shallow. So by p extending the highway, it'll actually kill off these beautiful ancient trees that have already been protected, <laughs> that, are a, that are a park. They're protected in a park. And if they widen the road, they're going to destroy something that has already been hard fought. So wildcalifornia.org and southcentralfarmers.org are both two great places to, to, um, to learn more. And at wildcalifornia.org, you can sign on to the petition saying, don't widen the highway. And I have to pardon myself because we're talking about nature all night and Mother Nature is calling me really badly. I'll be right back. Y'all talk amongst yourselves. I look forward to hearing about it. I'll be right back. Excuse me. <laughs> so there are what? Um, okay, thank you. Hi, my name is Zandra and I'm an addict. I want to thank... <laughs> I want to thank Ling for... Um, bringing light into my personal life. Um, I started PCC a few years ago, and Ling, I was one of the first classes that I took. 
And she gave me a lot to bring home to my family. And her class was on a Friday, so when you were speaking about bringing people to the party, <laughs> we had fun after class. I'd have a bunch of people over and talk about what I learned in Ling's class. So I just wanted to thank you because I am here for the extra credit, but, <laughs> but um, there were lots of choices that I had that I, you know, I could have used for my personal time. I am a mother of four. And what inspired me to come tonight was Ling, because I heard this was being, um, you know, that Ling was bringing this to PCC, and that's what inspired me to come and listen and to gain more knowledge and to learn more about what I can do and what I'm doing and how I can change and, and choosing, you know, making those personal choices, excuse me, making those personal choices that are important to make change in my life and for my family. So thank you, Ling, and thank you for coming. Thank you, Ling. Yeah, Ling. <laughs> thank you, guys. You just got me going for a few more years. <laughs> thank you so much. I really yeah. appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, I'll save the second part for my question until um, Julia comes back, because it's about um, Awakening the Dreamer, which I know that Julia is a part of. Um, so the first part of my question, uh, my name is Simon, um, and yeah, I'd like to thank Ling and Hannah for putting this great event on, and it's fantastic. Oh, hello. So um, the first part of my question was kind of real quick. Um, I first became aware of uh, you, Julia, during the um, Awakening the Dreamer event, which we had on PCC a couple of weeks ago, and you actually were in a video talking about where is a way. So I just wondered if you, um, would talk a little bit how you got involved with the Pachamama Foundation Awakening the Dreamer events, that kind of thing. Uh, and the second part of the question, I, um, I'm not really, I never used to be an anti-sustainability person, I just was never really aware of the issues. And so it's only really through actually Hannah being, badgering me about meat eating, and um, you know, sort of um, going to Awakening the Dreamer and seeing these things, and now tonight, that I'm st slowly starting to kind of realize my own addiction, as it were. Um, I guess if you have any advice for someone that's really new, I'm still kind of struggling with the whole meeting, eat, meat, eating meat, um, changing the lifestyle. I'm trying to do what I can, but it's difficult, you know, sort of in the home life, making those choices. Where do I start? Where do I really make the sort of first defining steps that this is where I'm going to take my life and then keep it going? Thank you for that. I think that's a, that's a question that's alive for a lot of folks. So as far as the Awakening the Dreamer and Pachamama lines, I, they just came to me and said, hey, we, we're doing this thing where we want to try and help get people present to the destruction, but in a way that awakens them to a new dream, a new possibility, and we want to interview you. And I knew uh, the folks at Pachamama Alliance from various collaborative work over the years, and I said, of course, I'll do that. So. They came to my backyard of my office and we hung out for a couple hours. They filmed me and they took a couple of pieces from it and used it in The Awakening the Dreamer. And then they had me in one of the first kind of advisory circles around that model to give them feedback to try and help it kind of become even more inclusive and um, hopefully now even more or less white-centric. Um, <laughs> you know, there's an interesting thing that we have to be careful of. I talk about two things. Number one, the minute we become passionate about something, we're one breath away from becoming a fundamentalist, which is, means we're going to kill something off. So that's number one. And then number two, especially in speaking for myself as a white person, even well-meaning white personified environmental activism or human rights or whatever, we have an accidental tendency to perpetuate this idea that as a white person I have the solution to the problem even though that's not <laughs> it's okay you can clap for that that it's not necessarily the case and that you know like this this the very very large words but very real impact of imperialism and colonialism and that it's this this way of being where we go in we disconnect people from their place we steal all the resources and then we say what we know what's best to solve the problem and so part of my work with the awakening the dreamer uh, group that created that process, and it's still an ongoing inquiry, is how to have it be less white-centric, how to have it really show up as, I want to be an ally. I recognize that my own peace and health and freedom and liberation is absolutely intertwined with yours. So luckily, the Awakening the Dreamer process is, is evolving in this inquiry to be more one that represents 
all people uh, and all species lifting up, which is, I'm really excited about because the Awakening the Dreamer Symposium is all over the world. So it's important that we really look at it in an inquiry without judgment to help it become its best possible tool in the world. And then the piece about what to do, I would just say that it's like when we, for someone who eats meat, the, the next best step is probably just be like, okay, how many times a day do I eat meat? Can I reduce that by once a day? And then down to once every couple of days. And just explore it. Um, the same with, with every, all the different things, reducing our waste. I mean, it's amazing to me how many times people come up to me with like their paper cup in their hand and their paper napkin. They're like, I'm sorry, Julia. It's like all of a sudden I'm mother confessor or something, you know? And I'm like, you don't have to apologize to me. You might want to go apologize to the tree, but you don't have to apologize to me. And, I, and I'm like, if anything, just, just use the fact that you're seeing me busting you using your paper cup and paper towel as a re recommitment of yourself to lessen that behavior, right? Because if, when they come and confess to me, they're not usually not actually going to change their behavior unless they just feel it as a renewed sense of commitment, which is a different feeling than a renewed sense of guilt. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I really feel that that's where it starts, with wherever the awakening is coming around, shifting your daily choices, how, m how many animals you're consuming for food. It just it, it, use it like an experiment as an inquiry and try lessening it here and lessening it there. And my experience is, is that it, it quits being, a, it stops being experienced as oftentimes. It does happen, but it's less and less felt like sacrifice or lack, and it more and more becomes so alive. I mean, look at us, you know, like we are so, we love living this way, you know. She has DH Loves Life as her website, because it's like, that's really what it is. It becomes this celebration of making choices that are better for the beings and this planet that we share, because we feel it in ourselves as a real affirmation of who we are too. And also those things are better for you. I mean, there's so much mercury in fish now, for example. They wash meat with ammonia before it's in your burgers. You know, all those, those things are not good for you. So whenever you're doing something that's better for you physically, your body is actually better for everything else. So it doesn't have to come from the outside. It can come from the inside. What's best for your actual health is better for the planet, is better for the fish and every other creature downstream. Hi, I'm Charligan. Hey. <laughs> um, I just wanted to speak on how, for me, sustainability has really helped to nurture, I guess, my social sustainability. You know, I, I'm not from California, but when I first moved out here, I lived in the San Fernando Valley, which to me is a hellhole. It's a lot of people not talking to each other. It's a lot of malls. It's a lot of overdeveloped land. There's sidewalks everywhere. What the hell is that? And um, then I moved out on my own and I moved here um, to the San Gabriel Valley and the first thing I discovered was this place called Oh Happy Days up in Altadena, California. And it's not only is it a restaurant, not only does it serve like good vegan food and uh, good products, it also has uh, co-op tables. So people are forced to talk to each other and you run into the most interesting people and you run into the most interesting conversations. And through that, I discovered the coffee gallery also in Altadena, same thing, people talking to each other all the time. And then I discovered um, time banking through the coffee gallery. And I'm sure the, co the Royal Co-op people will know about this, but time banking is an excellent way to, is a bartering system, but not just one-to-one, -one. it's a pay it forward system. I help you, you go help somebody else and you exchange time dollars for that. Through that, I discovered this place called Culture Club 101, and that's also located in Pasadena, and Culture Club 101, we sell only lacto-fermented foods. Um, we sell raw milk and raw cream from, direct from farmers. We do sell meat, but it's only grass-fed, pasture-raised cows. There is no treatment to the meat. The cows are, I personally believe if you're gonna eat anything, you need to treat it as though it's a god because it's going into your body. And something that's gonna be slaughtered, you need to treat it as though it is the most holy being there is because it's sacrificing itself for your well-being, and we only sell those kind of products. And the most important part of it is that not only do we sell these products, we teach people how to make their own krauts. We teach people how to make their own kefirs and their own kombuchas and all that. And honestly, that fosters so much 
more social sustainability. I taught myself how to make raw almond milk and it was a pain in the ass, part of my French, but because I was doing it by myself, I had several friends come over and were sitting there peeling skin off of these boiled almonds and it just fostered more and more conversation and more exchange of ideals. So I just wanted to share that with the audience that through searching for sustainability for the earth, you are sustaining humanhood and kindhood and love amongst everybody. So, and thank you oh, guys. Great, for thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name's Ken. Uh, I just wanted to share with everyone, the lady that was talking about composting earlier, uh, this Saturday, the 23rd at 9 a.m. at the Huntington Library, which you're talking about local, that's nearby here. I think most of you know where it is. It's just a couple blocks over to Allen Avenue, turn right, it's three or four blocks down. They're having a composting class for a couple hours, and I believe it's free. I didn't really check because I wasn't planning speaking here tonight. So those of you who are interested in composting, it's a great way to learn. So. Great. Thank you. And then I have a question for all of you up there. Earth Day's coming up in a few days, or it's tomorrow, isn't it? Yeah. So uh, do you have anything you're recommending uh, we all do, and what are you all doing? And can you t speak to that a little bit? Uh, well, Hannah, um, I, I met her initially at the Arcadia, when the Arcadia Flatland Woodlands was coming down. Um, and um, the Arcadia Four, the four tree sitters who tried to protect those woodlands from being bulldozed are um, actually uh, having their first day of trial tomorrow. So it would be a good thing to go down and support them. Um, that would be a cool thing to do. And Where is that, in the Arcadia it's Courts? No, it? it's actually downtown Temple oh. Street. Oh. Um, and uh, um, you think there's a, there's, um, I, I, I can't remember his website name about the Arcadia Woodlands, but if you look up Arcadia Woodlands, it's, I think it's something like Arcadia Woodlands dot something. Right. Um, and, um, and then I, I, I really like to just be in the natural world, be in the, out in nature on, on Earth Day and just, you know, take my feet, my shoes off and put my feet in, on the ground and feel heartbeat. And, and so uh, I also have been really busy this week with Julia. We've been traveling around, so all my critters really need a little love and attention and time. So uh, I have a chicken that just miraculously became unparalyzed. So I'm gonna uh, be giving her a lot of love. Homeopathic remedies fixed her, by the way. Um, and uh, you know, my pig and my dogs and all the critters, so I'll be doing that. Sounds fun. Yes, I, I think that whatever, whatever you choose to do for Earth Day, connecting with the Earth, you know, if you're on this campus connecting to the two little plots that you had to work so hard to get these two little plots to bring something other than grass back onto the campus, go take your shoes off, wiggle your toes in the spot on the edge. Don't, you know, don't disturb it too much. Don't, don't run anything over, but you know, feel it, touch it, say thank you. They thrive, flowers thrive, plants. And there's that DIY seed bomb thing up there. That is pretty cool. You can make a seed bomb. Oh right, bomb. to do it, you to do yourself seed, um, the seed bomb. You know, it's just like dirt and seeds, and then you just chuck it, and it starts to grow things. Uh, so it, you know, whatever you do for Earth Day, have it be about your community. Have it be about your place. Uh, if there's not something going on locally that really calls to you, have a a, um, a potluck with friends and have the whole thing be based on local and in season and just have people play with that. You know, something that just really connects to the wonder and the beauty and the awe of Earth Day because as we hear all the time, every day is Earth Day and we're kind of like, it's almost passe. So do something that makes it come very, very, very alive for you as a celebration of gratitude. I love that. Every day is Earth Day. Very Thank good. you so much. Thanks, Chris. Hello. <laughs> My name is Theo Sims, and I am here today. Uh, actually, I first want to say thank you. Thank you to my sisters and to my family for at least being curious and at best being in committed action because it's really inspiring to be in a room with other people who, who give a shit. <laughs> so um, I'm with an organization called Generation Waking Up and uh, I know you know what that is because we work with Joshua mm -hmm. 
And um, part of what we're doing is traveling around bringing the Awakening the Dreamer Symposium into schools and, and high schools and talking to young people about what, um, what is going on, first of all, and then what brings them to life and what the world needs and trying to connect those things. So we're traveling around in a biodiesel RV named Earthbeam, bringing like possibility and, and hope to young people and part of what we're doing, like we recognize our white tendency to want to go in and fix things and, and, and make a change, but like we're considering like what is it, what is the questions that we need to ask young people, like what are the important questions that, um, that we can ask them or what are some or what is the question that we can ask them that will really get them in that space of, of possibility and, and thinking about what's important, like ins inspiring questions. Thank you so much. We, it is nine, so uh, we have two more people who would like to have questions, so can we just um, do it briefly um, in, in uh, respect of our guest here? Sure. So yeah. thank you. Yeah. Did you have anything last you want to add? Or, well, or ask actually, or? that was my question, is okay. I was asking you, like, what would be a question that we could ask the young people? Well, I don't really, you know, it's interesting because I, normally I have a whole lot to say about everything, but mm -hmm. um, I've been, I've actually been mentoring Joshua uh, from mm -hmm. the very beginning for Generation Waking Up, and I'm mm. really proud to see Generation Waking Up growing up. It's super cool. Yeah. <laughs> so I've been blessed to be a part of this organization from its infancy, from mm -hmm. its, in the, in the womb stage. Uh, and I feel like <clears throat> the, the, you ask young people, what are the best questions to ask young people? Don't ask mm. me. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, thank you. And I just want to tell people, uh, we are bustthechange.org, and um, we are on the road, and we also require support to do what we do. So if you're interested, please check us out and support us if you feel joyful about that. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. so much. Hello. My name is Bob Schwarz, and uh, hi. <laughs> Um, I'm really loving this conversation. This is really great. Thank you for coming out tonight and hosting this event. It's really uh, inspiring. Um, I was also inspired back in the 90s uh, by seeing the clear cuts in Southern Oregon, and it led me down the road of opening a uh, green business and uh, selling recycled paper products and hemp things and energy efficient lighting and all that sort of stuff. And uh, I'm not doing that anymore, but I've over the years, I, I've heard many times that the, the most powerful thing you can do for the environment begins on your plate in terms of your diet and eating lower on the food chain. And there's been a little bit of talk about that. The Regulatory Commission is holding a public hearing on the San Onofre nuclear power plant on uh, April 28th, and it is open to the public. I was wondering if you've had any experience dealing with them and whether it's worth going down there and saying anything, or is it trying to reason with them, or is it better to go down there and do some kind of demonstration and protest and direct action? Or what, do you, what is your take on that? Thank you. <laughs> yes, yes to all of that. It's, you know, regardless of the outcome, it is important to speak up. It is important to act out, regardless of the, income, uh, regardless of the outcome. I lived across from Three Mile Island when it melted down. I was five years old. I was the only person in my family who got sick. I got sick. I saw spots, like when you get too many camera flashes taken in your eyeballs. Maybe you haven't had that, but if you have, you know what I mean. You get those, you blink and you see spots. I saw spots for days. I tasted, my mouth tasted like I was chewing on copper pennies. It tasted metallic for days, and I had an upset stomach. I didn't, I didn't feel good for a little over a week. And um, I later met Helen Caldicott, who's kind of world-renowned on nuclear issues, and she started crying when I told her that, because she was like, those are all symptoms of low-level radiation poisoning. So I got poisoned at five years old, and now it's Japan, and, and now what next? So for me, my passion is really about being a voice, not for the voiceless, because there is no such thing. My passion is being a voice for those who are not being heard. And, um, you know, there was... I was a five-year-old and I was poisoned by nuclear. Nuclear poisons future generations. It also poisons native communities because of digging up uranium and where we throw our toxic waste is on native community land. So there are also people who are not voiceless but who are not being heard. So if anything, going and speaking out at these hearings are about giving voice to the children now and in the future, giving voice to Native peoples giving voice to those who are speaking but who are not being heard. And I believe that it is important to speak into the universe 
and to say no and to, and to say yes to something else. I think speaking up and acting out is important regardless of the outcome. And um, that, because there's other forces that are speaking out and acting out all the time. So <laughs> we've, we've got to step it up. And as far as our food choices, I'm really clear from, you know, if you go to a factory farm or if you even go to a huge monoculture farm, even though I'm organic and vegan, I'm also like permaculture and biodiversity. I'm not for one big swath of clear cut of land with a bunch of lettuce growing on it either. Because <laughs> that's not healthy either. And I'm clear that the choices we make, our forks and our plates are literally, and I don't t use these words lightly, they are literally weapons of mass destruction or tools of mass compassion based on the choices that we make. And so whatever choice, <laughs> Whatever choice we make, it's about like looking at what is attached to what we stick our fork to and say, what is, the, what is the way I can eat that causes the least amount of harm and creates the most amount of joy and biodiversity? Go, do it. <laughs> Come on down to <laughs> Yeah, no, do it, do it, do it, please. That's exactly the kind of thing that we need if we want to see change. We need people to step up, and that's, you got to show up and step up and let yourself be heard. I am, I'm glad that you feel inspired, too. That's great. Well, I've been taking a few pointers from Christy Brinkley, and she says that the two things to focus on, the evacuation plan and the storage of the nuclear waste, and those are the really the weak, the Achilles heels to the, to the whole uh, false argument of safety that they give. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I want to personally thank you for supporting the Arcadia for tree sitters. And I wondered if um, the district attorney Cooley made any contact with you. And also the website for um, the Arcadia for is urbanwild.org. <coughs> And that also talks about the other, uh, the other actual right. little gems of exactly. natural wildlands that are left that are in imminent danger of being destroyed. Yes. So it's a, it's a really good uh, resource, urbanwild.org. Yeah. Well, at least 9.05, so I'll leave it up to you guys. you want to take the last question, or should we do something else? I think to be fair, just because we had already created completion okay. before, we should right, create cool. completion. We'll be around afterwards to answer your questions or to talk to anybody else, but as far as the microphone goes, because we'd already said we're bringing the conversation to completion, we should honor that commitment and honor the fact that some folks want to go, but they're staying here and yes. staying present until <laughs> we complete this conversation. So I want to honor that commitment and actually complete the conversation. <laughs> Thank you. Right. So, how, so, go ahead. Oh. Go. <laughs> Passing the mic here. Okay, all right. Well, thank you guys so much for showing up. That's always the very first step. I mean, I, I can't tell you, like, even when we were down at the South Central Farm, how hard it was to get people to just show up. You know, come and show up and lend your support and l l let your mind be open and, and give with your heart. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much for showing up. Uh, keep it up um, and uh, let your love shine and we're going to get there, you know. I think there's no other choice at this point. You know, it's either down or up, and we got to go up. So let's, uh, um, you know, let's do it together. Thank you so much. Yeah, and thank you. And thank you, Ling, for bringing us yes, here. Thank you thank so you, much. Thank you. Thank you. Not really. I'm now thank everyone. I'm just so, um, so honored that you are here and I was having this conversation with us. Thank you so much. <laughs>